Barnett. Um, I'm Chamorro, born and raised in Guam, and now I'm going to Mills College in Oakland studying ethnic studies. Um, I'm a student at the University of San Francisco, and I'm Chamorro, Puerto Rican, and Mexican, born and raised in the East Bay. Uh, I am Chamorro, born and raised in Guam as well, and I am a student at Diablo Valley College and a development studies major. Independent Guahan is a community-based organization and our mission really is to educate our community both on Guam and like where our tomorrows in the diaspora are um, about Guam's future as a political or Guam's future political status, specifically our future as an independent nation. I actually started uh, entering the work um, I'd say a couple years ago. I was always interested in decolonization and indigenous rights, cultural preservation, but I think um, I was able to meet um, Miguel, Dr. Vivaka, one of the co-chairs of Independent Guahan, and he introduced me to the organization, uh, gave me some more information on what they do, and I think I really uh, started working with them more when I went to the United Nations, and I testified on climate change issues, and so ever since then I've been um, involved with Independent Guahan in some capacity, mm -hmm. um, mostly based out here, but um, planning on going back home and helping out more locally. Mm -hmm. For me growing up on Guam, I think like I always had a lot of questions about like what Guam is and like what our relationship is to the U.S. because like we see all these stories when we're growing up that take place like in America and everyone speaking English and like looks different from us. Um, and then I grew up like in the context of like the planned military buildup. So the U.S. is currently planning to move originally, I think it was 8,000 and now it's down to 5,000 Marines who were stationed in Okinawa to Guam. Um, and this population of Marines were known to be like sexually violent against like the local population. So there was a lot of like community organization preparing for that military relocation. Um, and I just remember like seeing like these bumper stickers on people's cars that said like 8,000, how will they change our lives? And so there was just like a lot of questioning for me about like what does it mean to be growing up in the context of this like massive military buildup. Um, and like my dad had been active in Nishan Shamaro, which was one of like the earlier iterations um, of like the work that independent Guahan does. So they were also fighting for like a future Chamorro nation, a future independent Guahan. My mom also attended UC Berkeley. Um, she uh, studied ethnic studies. And so growing up her connection to not only our culture, but our history and our creation and like what it means to be Chamorro while also being you know removed from our ancestral lands. And so growing up with all those stories and my grandmother, my great grandmother, my Nina, so all of the women in my family have always passed down those stories of my great grandmother being a war survivor and mm -hmm. what that means for her and how she sits well or not being out here and being removed from from her her village and from her people and so i had that context and i didn't go back home um, to guahan until i was 17 right after i graduated high school so you know growing up with all these stories of my grandfather and my grandmother and you know their lives back home and then finally being able to connect with with where I'm from it was a very interesting experience and interesting in terms of actually physically being present in a lot of the issues that are happening to our people and to our community with militarism um, so when we say uh, independence um, what we really mean is like it is a political status mm -hmm. because in our decolonization movement on Guam there are three status options which is independence, free association, and statehood mm -hmm. and independence is um, the most um, sovereign option, it is the most um, separate from the United States where the Chamorro people or the Gu where our island of Guam can really decide for itself politically, mm -hmm. economically, culturally how it wants to um, kind of conduct itself in progress. We've looked at like food sovereignty, we've looked at the criminal justice system, we've looked at like elections, economics, all these like issues that are really immediate and connecting that to Guam's like fundamental inability to ever determine what those systems would look like if they were rooted in our cultural values. Because if you look at the Chamorro people, like our focus has always been on like sustaining our land, respecting our ancestors, providing a better future for our children, but these values have never been implemented in our political system, and that's why we have so many of these problems. So it's that work, but then it's also 
doing things like going to the UN, um, showing like the international community that Guam has a desire for independence. I think that when we talk about this this movement and this this work and what it means to be involved with our people, at the end of the day, we there's a very common theme of, well, we're doing this for our future and we're doing this for our ancestors. A lot of the work um, in any sort of like, uh, towards any sort of political status, because we are still conducting a referendum, a lot of it is conducted through community organizations. Mm -hmm. So in the case of independent Guahan, that is the major educational and community-based organization that has been leading um, the community in terms of becoming more aware of what independence is and just how to attain that status. So currently in our decolonization process, a lot of it has been um, has been kind of like hindered by the Dave Davis case. So it's been difficult for people mm -hmm. um, to be able to, I think, move forward in this issue mm -hmm. for a community to move forward. But there's still community organization that is being conducted. Uh, Independent Guahan has general assemblies mm -hmm. um, in which they conduct kind of like um, more education on what independence is and also related to other independent struggles and issues globally. Um, they also um, have other, they also are um, internally composed of different committees that carry out different work related to educating the community. And having the agency and the empowerment to receive the justice and the equity the justice that our people deserve mm -hmm. um, given our you know very long and uninterrupted history of colonization and how that is impacting our people and our land and our ocean and everything today and so independence is that that political status that is the direct avenue in redirecting ourselves into who we are who who we can be how, how do we return back or just you know, revitalize ourselves um, and, you know, the resources that are within our lands um, in a very crucial and healthy way. Once a year in October, usually the first or second week, the UN Special Committee on Decolonization, which is referred to as the Fourth Committee, meets. Um, and that's the opportunity when all of the territories that are listed on the UN's list of non-self-governing territories, which are basically like colonies, um, are able to go and present before the committee and before the international community around like issues plaguing their communities and also around like their desired future political status. So that trip was really historic because of like the large number of people who went. Like we put together a big group and then we were also joined by was it like three, four of our senators. Yeah, I think four was... of our yeah around four of our senators plus other governor. This year's trip was really historic too because it was all Chamorro women, and this was the first time um, that the delegation has been made up uh, entirely of women. And so that really goes back to like our culture's belief in like the Maga Haga, which were like the female leaders, and our ability to kind of really like achieve justice for our people and speak through the voices of our ancestors and for our future generations. Um, so this year we were able to organize a delegation. Um, and we presented before the fourth committee on like various issues plaguing Guahan right now and that are like impediments to our decolonization and we urged the UN to send a visiting mission to Guahan to kind of observe the militarization process and make recommendations. Um, and in last year's trip, Independent Guahan was able to work with Venezuela and they were the chair of the committee at that time and so they worked really closely with us to um, edit the UN resolution on the question of Guam to have stronger language against militarization and stronger language in favor of protecting the self-determination process. So it can just kind of feel very bureaucratic in that you're trying to navigate the United Nations, um, really vocalize the issues of your people and of decolonization in your territory or colony, but at the same time just also being faced with obstacles of people not being as sensitive to the issues mm -hmm. or just having to go through um, the process that is kind of testifying at the United Nations. Um, it's also financially difficult to mm -hmm. get to the United yeah. Nations mm -hmm. because you are not funded by the UN. You have to get there, everything from flights to lodging mm -hmm. to actually physically being present, that is all on the petitioner. Mm -hmm. So it really limits the ability of people to be able to attend in their fullest capacity. And so for 
uh, these nations that are not close to New York, it can like Guam, it can be very difficult. And that's part of like been the difficulty of really bringing a huge delegation to the UN is just the cost itself. I remember in our, um, in that meeting that we had with the, uh, the group from Puerto Rico, um, just like the, the generational differences and just receiving that type of mentorship in that space and, you know, being in the struggle and, you know, it's, it's a lifelong journey and, mm -hmm. you know, being, taking pride and taking value in our youth in, in those spaces is really important. Like when it feels like there's a lot of pressure, it's like realizing that the movement as a whole is so much bigger than we are and that yeah. it's going to continue beyond us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, as the next generation to kind of carry this movement forward, it is very important that us, you know, young people are involved in the movement. I think as Elena and Samantha have mentioned, you know, we've had, um, you know, very young people get involved. I think mm -hmm. uh, just even with our old woman delegation, mm -hmm. most of us were under the age of 25. Mm -hmm. So we have very young people involved yeah. in the movement. And so it's just kind of keeping that momentum going and, you know, letting, you know, kind of also reminding young people that you don't necessarily have to be older or in an elected mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. or even representing like the head of a grassroots movement to get involved. Yeah. It's just um, remembering sort of the importance of the movement, what it means for your people, your culture, you know, your island.